chapter 1. morning. Um, anyway, talking about uh, giving, uh, last, um, well, last, just this, yesterday, uh, we were, some of us were here to uh, do a presentation to the Spanish church and get a picture from, from that moment. Boom. Boom. Somebody's giving me power over this thing. No. No. Stop clicking. Stop clicking. <laughs> now you can click. There we go. All right. Anyway, uh, we, we presented Aristides, who is officially not the pastor. There's Aristides kind of between Ken and I uh, with this little statue. Uh, there's a translator there. That was just yesterday at the, uh, yes, that's me in a suit and tie. That's, believe it or not. Uh, I knew that that was their dress code, so I came, I came prepared. But um, uh, we, we presented them with black. Aristides and his congregation, but really Aristides, God bless him, uh, saved us thousands, thousands, thousands of dollars uh, by repairing our gym roof uh, with the air conditioning unit there and stuff, and found some other stuff like that. And there was, there was about a dozen of our people there. I really appreciate you coming. Uh, that were there and uh, represent our congregation. It was interesting service, translation going on, uh, singing in Spanish and so forth. Um, I think the dozen that were there will appreciate their pastor a little bit more. <laughs> because the pastor that spoke there, what, what was it, an hour-long message? An hour-long message. Uh, and he, he had more material. He, he cut it down. Uh, and I think maybe because of all the... Uh, all, all those Anglo's that were there, uh, but uh, but it was it was an interesting um, uh, morning, and um, so anyway, I just wanted you to be up on, on the day with that. Okay, I, I'm on a series I'm, I'm calling through Mary's eyes. Um, it was a few years ago that Mary Lynn and I uh, got to go and spent some time on sabbatical, and one of the things we did with uh, some money that was given to us, was to uh, get on a cruise, and we did a, a little tour through uh, part of the Mediterranean, and one of the things that Mary Lynn and I did was uh, go to Rome, and in Rome we got to go to the, the Vatican, uh, which was something very interesting to me because of all the art. I really enjoyed the art, and um, so you, you go through this tour, you see lots of art and stuff, and one of the things everybody wants to see, of course, is one of the things you want to see is the... Uh, the Sistine Chapel. Uh, that's uh, Michelangelo's painting in the in the chapel. That's the chapel where they vote on the you know the next pope and stuff like that. Uh, a confession at this moment. Uh, that's a picture your pastor took. You're not supposed to take pictures inside the Sistine <laughs> Chapel. But I just kind of had my camera up, no flash on, and uh, just kind of clicked uh, three or four shots. And so that's <laughs> yeah, confession. But it, it, you wonder if you see if you see something like that if you really be as impressed as you as you might uh, expect yourself to be, and it, it really was. We we went really we came in a little side door on the thing through a whole troop of people. There are people that were rolling around in this chapel, <clears throat> and uh, uh, some uh, some Italian guards standing there going, "No pictures, no pictures," you know, because there are tourists who are not smart enough to turn off their flash. And but it really was impressive, just seeing that. I mean, that's just a portion of it. Way up there above it, this beautiful artwork that uh, Michelangelo painted uh, by hand, you can imagine, like that. And then after that, you go on out into uh, the, uh, the square, the big square, and you go into uh, uh, Peter's uh, cathedral, you know, the cathedral.
beach home, and you walk in there, and then you're listening with the headset to your tour guide, and they're, they're talking. And sometimes you can see your tour guide, so I put some people everywhere, people everywhere, milling it everywhere, milling it everywhere, and stuff. And then, I'll, after a little while, I turn to my right, and I look over to the side, and, and there was the, um, the piata, the, the, the sculpture that really kind of made Michelangelo famous. <clears throat> the only sculpture he, he signed, because he was standing around while some guys were watching, uh, looking at it, and they had credited it to one of his competitors. And so he came back and chiseled in his name, and uh, the, the thing across Mary's breast there has his name chiseled in it. Uh, it it's a fantastic piece of work. I, you know, I just couldn't believe it, that um, this, this piece of art, these two great pieces of art to me, I was seeing them in person, you know, uh, fantastic works. Just to be able to stand there and look at that is, and appreciate the beauty. You know, it, it's one thing to see these things in photos. It's, um, it's another thing to see them for yourself. It's another thing to see them for yourself. Um, as I said, hold that thought for a while. We've been in this series uh, called Through Mary's Eyes, and last Sunday... Uh, I talked about a passage that they called the, the Annunciation, and as I told you before, you know a particular passage is important when you give it a name, when you give it a name, and uh, the passage, that passage dealt with the, the announcement of Jesus Christ coming to the world, the incarnation of Jesus, the incarnation, the incarnation, Jesus of the begotten of flesh. So Mary, again, is a very likely a teenage girl. We, we don't know that, but there's a good possibility. And she's been told by the archangel Gabriel, big time, uh, that though she was still a virgin, that uh, she would become pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that she would become the, the mother of the only begotten Son, the Father. That term in John 3.16 is very important. The only begotten is very, very important. And it designates that Jesus has a special relationship, unlike any other person uh, in the history of creation, with the Heavenly Father, the only begotten. So this announcement, as you Bible scholars know, is both thrilling and scary at the same time. Thrilling and scary. Uh, Jesus is, uh, excuse me, Mary's engaged to the carpenter Joseph. And then you know the drama that goes on there. What will Joseph think has to be going through Mary's mind? What will the people of Nazareth do? Uh, what will they think? What will they do? You know, by law, she is to be stoned. You know, and just put yourself in the place of this teenage girl, put in this situation. And, and one of the things that, that Gabriel shares with Mary in this Annunciation is about her relative, cousin or aunt, we don't really know the, the relationship, um, Elizabeth. And that's Luke 136. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her uh, who was called barren. For God, with God, nothing will be impossible. Great words. So you, you, you get that little bit of information, the tidbit information. You're told this big announcement. You give them that tip a bit of information, and um, you know, what would you do? You probably would do what, just exactly what Mary did. She heads off from the town of Nazareth, and she goes to the region of Judea, the hill area, the hilly area of Judea. They don't really know for sure where exactly Elizabeth is at, but they have guesses to go visit her aunt, her cousin, or, or whatever. Verse 39. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a cold. Please forgive me. In the city of Judea and entered the house of Zacharias, uh, Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. <coughs> greeted Elizabeth. And I, you do a little search on the internet and you find pictures of Elizabeth greeting Mary. Uh, kind of like that one. Because uh, Elizabeth looks old. Um, I kind of like this one for, for Mary because she looks young. Elizabeth, she needs a little more age on her for, for my taste. But, uh, you know. Elizabeth is 
likely the one place where Mary knows where she can find understanding. The home of uh, Zacharias, who can't talk at this moment. Uh, some indication that he can't hear either, because they have to write out stuff to him. That's a safe place to go. Not because Zacharias can't talk, but you know. <laughs> she would have felt the urge to go to someone who has also been so miraculously blessed. And when Mary gets there, something very strange happens. Very strange happens. <clears throat> and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary. The baby leaped in her womb. Leaped. <laughs> Tell me what that feels like. Uh, I'm just trying to imagine leaping. John the Baptist, who's inside her womb, is, is leaping around. And, and Elizabeth somehow knows that her baby, John, John the Baptist, leaped in her room in response to Mary's greeting. Uh, how does she know this? Well, I don't know how she knows this. But Elizabeth is somehow inspired by the Holy Spirit that John knows that it's what's going on inside, inside Mary. Now John is six months along, and he, he's about a foot long, and he weighs about one and a third pound. And I'll just add that in some states, he is just inside the legal age for abortion. Clearly, God considers this unborn child to be a person. A viable entity capable of responding to God's spirit. And the child John the Baptist is responding to a creation of God that consists of 16 cells. 16 cells. Clearly God places a high value on the unborn life. Down to his early stages. I'll just say that. Without apology. Going on. Luke 1. Verse 41. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, and then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told for her from the Lord. Now, now, we read those verses, and, and what we're reading really is, is kind of a, a poetry and, and a song uh, that Elizabeth is breaking out into. She's, she's breaking forth in song. A blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is it granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me, for indeed, as soon as the voice of your greetings sounded in my ears, the, the baby leaped to my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed. For there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. It's interesting that Luke, this is kind of a side note, but that, that Luke, in his writing, has committed uh, several passages to song. Uh, uh, Luke uh, alone does this. Uh, Elizabeth sings. Uh, Zachariah sings. Simeon, when they later on get to the temple, sings. The angel sings. And, and then, then Mary sings. So Luke is recording these songs. These songs. And this, but here's the, here's the response of Mary. Then Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations she will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arms. He has shattered the proud in the imagination of our hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lonely. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and to his seed forever. Now again, whenever you, you have a passage that's important, it's given a name. And this passage is called the, the Magnificat. <laughs> or Mag Magnificat. I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's, it's got a name. Uh, the name is derived from the, uh, 
from the very old translation, Latin translation of the Bible. Uh, the, the, the Vulgate. The Vulgate. I'm giving you a history lesson here. You like that, don't you? The Vulgate comes from the 4th century. So 400 years after Jesus came, around about that time, some people, St. Jerome and others got together and, and they began to translate from, from the Hebrew uh, uh, the Bible into Latin. And uh, the title of this particular passage comes from the very first word that, that Mary speaks, the mag Magnificat. In English, the very first word is my, but it doesn't sound cool to call it the my, so uh, that's where it gets its name. And what we have here is one of the earliest songs in the Christian church. It has been sung in churches for generations, especially if you have a Catholic background, has been sung for years and years. And you may have heard it, but you probably didn't understand it because it is sung, often sung in Latin. And let me just kind of give you some, some notes about, uh, some details about this. These aren't in your notes, but uh, some interesting characteristics. Uh, number one, uh, this, the song is, is very similar to uh, Hannah's song. If you go to 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10, Hannah, who was barren herself and, and became pregnant and had Samuel, who was one of the, Israel's great high priests, uh, it, there's a lot of similarities between that song and Mary's song. Uh, two, it, it is filled with Old Testament allusions, especially echoes of the, the book of Psalms. And, and the style falls a very similar pattern to, to, to Hebrew poetry. The, the style is kind of a, a double line, double line, saying the same thing two times, two times, two times, two times. And, and, and interesting, maybe more than anything else, it really makes no mention of the coming Messiah. And the fact that Mary is carrying this child in her womb. womb. You know, she, it's like she doesn't talk about that at all. She doesn't sing about it at all. Let me read it again. I mean, if you have your Bibles there. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. And we should call Mary blessed. Uh, she deserves to be honored. Um, and because she has certainly served generations by becoming the mother of of the Messiah. 49, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. For he has shown strength with his arms. He has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from thrones and exalted the lonely. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his servant. He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Now, I'll, I'll confess something here. Uh, I really didn't know if I had ever really preached on this passage before. Uh, and, and just this morning, I thought, well, I'll just check and see if I've got one in my, my, my catalog. And looked in there, and my uh, file door, sure enough, Two years ago, I preached one right here on, on this. On this, so that's how impressive I am to myself. I don't even remember what I was speaking. But it, it's it's not really the kind of, of of passage where you you know you jump in there and say, "Man, there's a, a lot of meat here uh, for me." Um, and, and that's what I got to ask myself. You know, what is here for me? What is this song about? What can I get out of this song? And that's a challenging sometimes. When you look at some biblical passages, and when I look at passages, I, I try to I try to put myself in there, and I try to ask myself, what's going on here? And and as you know, this this seems like a strange song for I don't know for a young Jewish girl. I'm not an expert on the music that young Jewish girls said in the or wrote in the first century. I suspect that there are some that look at those passages and might question whether Mary actually wrote it. And the critic might look at it and say, well, that, that had to be added at a much later date. But there are certain things we need to appreciate about this, is that 
A, for one thing, all Israelite children from the, from the earliest childhood were taught those songs in the Bible. They, they're, they're scripture, the Old Testament scriptures. And, and they sang them together around home circles. And so it would have been natural for Mary to break out in a song similar to the one of Hannah. It would have been very natural for her. On top of that, the trip from Nazareth to, to, Beth, uh, to not Bethlehem, but the Judea area, was probably about three days. And here she is traveling, and she has time to reflect and, and to think upon but all the stuff that is happening to her. You know, her mind would have just been filled with thoughts about all that is going on. What Gabriel told her. And then, then Mary's song, you know, let's, let's not ignore the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Spirit in her life. And she's inspired by the Holy Spirit. She breaks out in this verse. She had, has had an encounter with God. And one can't help but believe that she's under the influence of the Spirit when she's sang out before Elizabeth and the unborn child, John. Again, my, my soul <coughs> magnifies the Lord. Magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. What does that mean? To magnify the Lord. What does that mean? You know what it means to magnify something, don't you? Uh, and I looked it up. I get the opportunity to decrease the apparent size as of one does as a, uh, as a lens, to make greater an actual size, to enlarge, to magnify a, a drawing, and preparing for a fresco, to cause to seem greater or more important, to attribute too much importance to exaggerate, to magnify one's abilities, to make more exciting, intensify, dramatize, heighten. And then finally, to extol or, or to praise. And I, I suspect that that kind of echoes what uh, Mary was doing. Magnify the Lord. You know what it's like to look through a magnifying glass, don't you? You know? This is a cheap one I bought some time ago. It's no good. Oh. It's terrible. You, know? you magnify something. You, you, you focus in on something. I can't even get a good focus on the scripture there. Magnify. You're looking through. Have you, have you ever taken one of these? Oh, I'm talking to the kids now. You ever take one of these and, you know, focus the sun rays through them? Really? You done that? Yeah, yeah, you've done that. Yeah. Focus the sun rays. And you kind of play God, little G over the ants. <laughs> have you ever done that? Yeah. I never have. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's what it, I'm thinking about. Magnify. You're just focusing the, the light rays from the sun, and you're, you're concentrating it on a spot. You know, my soul magnifies the Lord. It's kind of two ways of looking at it. You're blowing God up or you're just focusing on God. I think it's that focusing on God that, that I'm thinking about. Mary has just had a, a remarkable encounter with God through his angel Gabriel. And, and that would have been something. And she had three days of traveling to reflect and rejoicing upon. Living in the awe of what has happened to her. And the implications and the implications are, are fantastic. Fantastic. Three days to think. Three days to ponder. And then there's this strange and wonderful moment with Elizabeth when her unborn son leaps in her womb. And, and Mary, after experiencing that, just, just breaks out in praise. And her, her soul magnifies the Lord and what he is doing in her. Her, her soul is focused on, on what is happening in her life. And here's the question I have. And the question is, for myself, you know, has my soul ever magnified the Lord? To tell you the truth, I think it's an unfair question. Because 
I'm really not honestly altogether sure what that means to magnify the Lord in my, in my soul. I will tell you that there have been there have been special moments in my life where I have sensed God's presence and I feel such closeness to Him. And in those moments I, I feel, not, not that my relationship is based upon feeling, but I'm a feeling person and so are you. And God intersects with us. I feel a special bond, and I, I'm rejoicing that moment, and my thoughts are about Him, and my songs of praise during that moment are very dear, and, and everything I sing becomes real in a way that I have never sensed it before. I, I will also tell you that when I come here and I sing praises to God, I want to very much to, to, to sense the Lord's special presence. And ministers are the worst at it. <laughs> because there are so many things that we're thinking about. You know, how is the temperature in this room? And, you know, well, people are here. And uh, what's going on? What's happening next? What i got to do? What I'm going to say? And so forth and so forth. So many things. I'm not focused. One of the tricks I, I do, I, I wasn't so good at this morning, uh, even knowing this, <laughs> this was in my message, because of my... my uh, my cold, I uh, didn't feel much like singing, but one of the tricks I often do is, is to try to imagine myself in the throne room of God, as John described it in the book of Revelation, and singing with, with the countless multitudes of the nations before the throne of God, and that has, that has a way of inspiring me to, to look forward to that day, and, and I, I am in a moment trying to rehearse um, that moment, in this morning when we were singing, Oh, come, let us adore him. I was trying to imagine what that would be like. You know, wouldn't that be wonderful to write a song in your lifetime that one time will be sung in heaven? Can you imagine that? I don't know. I think I'd be full of pride. I guess that's good pride, I guess. Oh, come, let us adore him. I was trying to imagine the heavenly multitudes going in procession in the throne room of God, carrying candles like we do on, uh, you know, at Christmas time. Oh, come, let us adore him. What would that moment be like? Just gathering together. That kind of helped me focus on that song. To try and, and magnify the Lord. It's like the spiritual discipline I put myself in as an exercise on my part to try to focus on him, to magnify him. And for Mary in that moment, I think it would have been easy to be filled with praise, magnifying the Lord. Mary magnified the Lord because of the incomprehensible work of the Spirit of God in her life. And that's the challenge for me to remember and appreciate the incomprehensible working of God in my life. That He saved me from my sins. And that I have redemption. One day I will be in that throne room in heaven, magnifying the Lord. You like that, Amen? Yeah. You know, that's an old-fashioned way of saying you agree with the pastor, so, yeah, I agree with you. Magnify the Lord, people. Now, if you study that song, you'll see that uh, in the Magnificat, uh, Mary uses the phrase, he has, King James Version, he hath, eight different times. And those uh, eight different things the Lord has done. And I can recognize the, uh, the eight, in the eight that he has, she has really basically breaks it down to three sections. It's people that analyze these things help us kind of break these things down. Uh, there are Mary's song, three sections in, in Mary's song. What Mary sings about. She sings about, number one, what, what God did for her, for Mary, for her. Uh, for he has regarded the lowly state of the, his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he is mighty. He has done great things for me. Now, 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 now I don't want to let something slip by you there. <coughs> Take note of those words. He has regarded. He has regarded. Amplified version, he has looked upon. Uh, Philip's translation, he has deigned to notice.
notice me. <laughs> I like that. That's not the word I use very often, gain, but uh, I think I may put it in my category, my uh, catalog. Uh, King James Version, for he hath regarded, he hath regarded. He, he regarded her, which means he was, he was mindful of her. Now, I asked this question last Sunday. Uh, why did God choose Mary? Uh, we don't know. We get the feeling, the idea that she was a, a very good person. She wasn't perfect. Uh, we know that. But, but think about the possible, all the other possible, I don't know how many other young Jewish girls there were in Nazareth at that time. I guess Jesus didn't necessarily have to be born at that exact time, but, uh, you know, I'll leave that in God's hands. He knew the right moment. There could have been a lot of young maidens around, but of all the young maidens, I don't know, God regarded her. And because of God's work in her, she has been changed from some kind of insignificant, really poor Hebrew maiden to the most highly honored woman in the history of the world. He has regarded me the lowly state uh, of his handmaid. He regarded her. Now maybe it's just me, because I'm a really insecure person. Um, but if you ever gone to a party, I'm kind of talking to you guys down here now. If you ever gone to a party and there's people all around, all around, all around, all around and you're wondering, uh, does anybody even know I'm here? You know? Does anybody even recognize me? Do they even, do they, even, do they think I'm, what do they, they don't even think about me. You ever been there? No. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. I wouldn't expect you to. You're so secure. Probably I'm the only per insecure person in here. I'd like that. You know, they, they have, they really have no regard of me. Oh, let me tell you something. Let me tell you, let me tell you down here. Uh, uh, God has regarded you. God has regarded you. And not only you and every person in this room. He is thinking about you. His mind is on you. He, he knows about you. I like this passage of scripture. Psalms 8. What is man? Man, woman, people. Put it. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him? For you made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. What is man that you are mindful of him? Here's the truth, people. Um, you're not lost in the crowd. Uh, you're not some kind of number statistic on a, on a uh, tally sheet. He knows the very number of the hairs on your head. And I know that for me, that's a subtraction job daily. You know, okay. <laughs> but why would he take time to know that? <laughs> because he has regarded me. Just like he, he picked some young virgin girl in the little town of Nazareth, a dirty little town of Nazareth, thought about her. His mind is on you. You are not lost to him. <coughs> Amen? Amen? You are not lost to him. He's regarded you. I like that. Um, and two, what God did for us. What God did for us. And his mercy to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arms. He has scattered the, the proud in the imagination of his heart. And he's put down the mighty from their thrones. He has exalted the lowly. He has lifted the hungry with good things. And the rich he has swept away. There are three groups in there that God has shown mercy to. Uh, uh, a, the helpless. Uh, B, the, the humble. And C, the hungry. I like how those all begin with H, so I had to throw that at you. <laughs> the humblest, the humble, I would, you know, it's good to be humble, but I think we're talking about the humiliated. And the hungry. Which category do you fit in? Some people.
people are feeling kind of helpless today. I don't know what, for what reason. There are probably some people who are feeling helpless. Maybe some people are feeling put down. A little humiliated. I don't know. What happened to you this week that humbled you? That you didn't want to humble you? I don't know. Could be people that are here that are hungry. They're not sure where the next meal is coming from. I don't know. justice and civil rights and they were often hungry and downtrodden and, and discouraged and, and if you notice that Mary is talking about kind of a, a, a return of values, a, a flip of fortunes Mary realizes that the, the Lord has turned the world's value system upside down, it's not the rich who are getting the help it's not the powerful, it's, it's the helpless, it's the hungry in the, the humble that he values and he lifts up everything about the world system and how it operates has been, has been turned upside down because here she is, just a, a young maiden blessed with God's only begotten son is that ever, wow the grace of God worked contrary to the thoughts of the world system what does that mean? what does that mean? That mean there, there is a place for me in his kingdom. There is a place for me. And I may feel kind of unskilled. I may feel uneducated. I may feel untalented. I may feel unbeautiful. I may feel unwhatever. But in God's economy of things, uh, that doesn't matter. In his own accounting system, he values me. And you. humiliated and without means. God's mercy shines upon me. He has regarded you. Three, what God did for Israel. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. He has spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Okay, here, here it is. Um, uh, Mary has been told that the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah who they have been waiting for a long time is coming now. The fulfillment of the promise given to Adam generations ago is, is coming now. Now, you know, she was raised on those Hebrew scriptures and she knew the stories about what God did and, and, and how God showed himself and how God delivered Israel in a mighty way. And, and very importantly, how he, he promised the great patriarch Abraham that there would be a great nation rise from him. And all these stories, can you imagine? All these stories were suddenly coming into being. Going back to my illustration about Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel and, and the Piazza. It's one thing to hear about the stories of old. But Mary in those days, they had become very real. He has helped his servant Israel, verse 54. He, 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 he really had three days of thinking on that. All that stuff. All those things. All that stories. It didn't matter it had been 400 years since they last heard from God. He had not forgotten them. He spoke to our father Abraham, to Abraham to his seed forever. Those promises were coming alive for Mary. Now, right beside of me. Wow. And, and, and my prayer for you, here's my prayer for you as, as a result of this message, is that, that you would be able to come to the same realization that Mary had. That you would have a revelation of God's spirit within you that gives you the heart certain uh, uh, <coughs> assurance that he has help for me. In, in his mercy, he remembers me. And like the promise he made to the nation of Israel, I can trust in his promises. A revelation of God. A heartfelt revelation. God is real. And he will act. In you, for you. Amen. He has regarded you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to come to
our time where we celebrate uh, the, the gift that God gave us. And, and really, it's kind of an interesting reflection upon Mary, who had the promise of God within her, growing within her. Uh, we take in the elements which are a symbol of, uh, of God's great gift for us, a symbol of his body broken for us, a symbol of his, of his blood. Now, when the, the elements are being passed out, again, we'll pass them out and then we'll receive them together. But um, um, you'll be listening to the Magnificat. Uh, it's in Latin, so you won't understand the words, but it will be a time for you to listen, to reflect, and to pray, and to try and appreciate this revelation of God that, that he brought to us and in your life. So I encourage you to take time just to reflect and to think. Uh, the, the, the song is beautiful. Uh, the word's unfamiliar. But uh, it is a time to reflect and to think um, and, and to pray. Um, so uh, I'll ask my helpers to come forward as I pray. And we'll receive, they will pass out the elements and then I'll instruct you. Dear Lord Jesus, you came. Came in the world. One cell, two cells, three cells, a tiny infant in your mother's womb. You came as a result of a promise being fulfilled. And yet, you came, the child came, you came to die for us. What a revelation of God you were, you are to us. And now, Lord, as we receive these elements together, pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just... Uh, bless us with the opportunity to sense, to magnify you in our hearts, Lord. And help us, we pray. And in your name we pray. Amen.
make sure everybody has had a chance to receive the elements that wants to. If you haven't, please indicate and we will be sure to serve you. A very old song, 1600 years old, um, but this ceremony <coughs> we're participating in uh, exceeds it by uh, 400 years. Jesus a night with his disciples gave them just a very simple ceremony to remember. And so that's what we are doing. We are honoring the Lord by remembering his gift to us. And Paul writes, For I receive from the Lord what I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the, the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had taken it, he had given thanks he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take now and receive and remember. Thank you, Lord. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take now, receive, and remember. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood. For whenever you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Even now, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. 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 Lord, thank you for, again, for this moment of remembrance. Thank you for this church and these people. Help us to be people that magnify you. We are honored that you have regarded us, Lord, and that your promises are still, still true to this day. Thank you. Go with us now. In your name we pray. God's people said,